Is there anyone online watching? Do we know? Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm trying to see if I can hear myself over the speaker. Those are my instructions. I can. Do we know if anyone is watching us online? Because we're live, apparently. But there is someone watching? There is someone. OK, welcome. Hi. OK. Um, hi. Come on in. Um, OK. Closer? Oh, now, now I can hear. OK. It seems a little silly, but um, come on in. Come on in. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Yael, and I am a social worker, and I work with the Alzheimer's Association, um, California Southland chapter. Um, for those of you who don't know, we are a national organization, and we provide free resources and support for, um, for anyone who is caring for someone with Alzheimer's disease. This is can you, can I can't, okay, I'll stick with the mic. Anyway, um, we're gonna be doing a little bit of learning about Alzheimer's, just a, a smidge, and then I'd love to answer any questions that you have, and then I'd, I really wanna hear a little bit more about what, what would be helpful for you to, to see us deliver as, as services. Um, okay, so, oh, I go over here. It worked when I practice ran it. Mm -hmm. It's on. It is not clicking. Well, it worked when I ran it, when I practiced it. I'll just stand here and look pretty. <laughs> just kidding. Thank you guys for coming. I know it's a little bit of a weird Weird week. Yeah. Um, while we're waiting, oh, while please. we're waiting, <laughs> hi. Um, welcome, everyone. I just wanted to um, officially uh, thank Yael White for being here with us from the Alzheimer's Association. My name is Carolyn Hoffman. I am um, a licensed clinical social worker and the director of the Sinai Temple Mental Health Center. Um, and I'm really, really thrilled to have. Yael with us this morning to provide um, this informational community forum on understanding Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So um, for those of you um, here, welcome officially to, um, to the temple and to those of you online, um, welcome um, and uh, the uh, you should be able to ask questions, I believe, is that correct, um, in the chat um, on YouTube. So um, we'll be monitoring that. If you have questions, um, we'll try to answer them, uh, I guess, at the end of the presentation. Um, so welcome, and I'll turn the floor back over to Yael. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So can I just, can I take it out? No, I will leave it in. Okay. Um, so today we're going to talk about what Alzheimer's is, the impact of Alzheimer's disease, um, why we're here, and what we can do together. Um, we're going to share the impact of Alzheimer's. We're going to listen to your experiences and your community um, issues, identify community needs and gaps, and see what else, how we can better work together. So for those of you who don't know, and you probably you, you hear this often, but dementia is the umbrella term for, for this disease, okay? And de um, dementia means that there is a loss of memory and other thinking abilities severe enough to interfere with your daily life, right? So that means you're having trouble, not just, it's not that you're just forgetting things, it's that it's, it's somehow impacting your day-to-day -day life. Short-term memory is generally the first to go, but it means that you're having problems making appropriate decisions. It means that you are having trouble understanding time and structure. It means that you are under, having difficulty understanding um, 
distance and spatial relations. Um, it means that you are getting confused because you're having kind of elevated um, reactions to things that that aren't that don't don't require that, right? It, you're showing up for your daily your daily appointment or your weekly, let's say your weekly appointment at the senior center or club of some sort and you're showing up at the wrong day, wrong time and not understanding what, what was wrong. You're not able to retrace your steps. You're not able to recall. So it's impacting your daily life. So we have different types of dementias. Alzheimer's is the most diagnosed type of dementia. Then we have vascular dementia, which is usually caused by a stroke or a head injury. Then we have Lewy bodies dementia, which is dementia with Parkinson's symptoms. Then we have frontal temporal dementia, which is FTD. Um, that's what Bruce Willis uh, has been diagnosed with. So that impacts the frontal lobe of your brain, which really impacts your behavior. Um, and then we have dementia symptoms can come from Huntington's disease. And then we have um, mixed dementias of more than one cause. So those are the, the types, different types of dementia that we have. Um, you can use the term Alzheimer's and dementia interchangeably. Some people prefer one over the other, but um, Alzheimer's is the most diagnosed type of dementia. So who's at risk? The 80 plus population is at greatest risk for this disease, but that doesn't mean that you turn 80 and boom, you get Alzheimer's. We all become forgetful. Forgetfulness is a part of normal aging, but the 80 plus population is at highest risk. Family history is also a concern. Um, you can carry, you can, Alzheimer's disease is both hereditary and not hereditary. So you can carry the gene and you can get it. You can carry the gene and not get it. You can not have the gene at all and get it. So there's a, we don't, <laughs> we're working really hard to try to find the answer of what, what's going on there, but family history can definitely impact um, who's at risk. Um, as I said, Ha having the hereditary gene, um, a head injury, and lifestyle. So we always want to encourage a healthy lifestyle. It turns out, this is, this is the biggest news of the day, that what's good for your heart is also good for your head. So having daily physical exercise, having daily social interactions, having, having daily cognitive stimulation, um, having a healthy diet, all those things are good for your heart and are also good for your brain because they're interconnected. Um, so one in three seniors dies with Alzheimer's or other dementia, and it kills more than breast and prostate cancer combined. Um, someone is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease every 65 seconds in this country. Um, the African American and Hispanic populations are at high risk for this disease, and um, they get they they're often less likely to go and to go to the doctor and get a diagnosis and find out more information for support. Um, the impact of caregiving is tremendous. Um, people age 65 plus survive an average of four to eight hours, sorry, survive an average of four to eight years after a diagnosis, and some live as long as 20 years. But when you are caring for someone with this disease, and I talk about this in my support groups all the time, this disease is able to take both of you down with it, right? It doesn't care. Doesn't have, doesn't, does, it's not concerned for everyone's well-being. Um, what we get so wrapped up in the caregiving needs that it causes us to be stressed, anxious, not sleep, hurt, our, hurt ourselves physically from lifting or transferring or bathing or all these things. They all have an impact on our, as a caregiver, on our day-to-day -day lives. Um, individuals with Alzheimer's will spend an average of 40% of time in dementia's most severe stages. So they say from date of diagnosis, you can look back in hindsight two to five years and, and then say, uh, all right, now I understand like that made sense. Like weird things were happening that you probably just they kind of ignored. But when you look back in hindsight from date of diagnosis, you're like, ah, like, now I understand. 10 years, at least 10 years prior to the disease, uh, prior to diagnosis, things were already happening physically. Changes were happening in your brain that you weren't aware of, that you wouldn't have even thought to check out. And then post-diagnosis, um, they say that they're, they generally refer to Alzheimer's in stages as early, middle, and late stage. So you, um, it's hard to say how long you'll spend in each stage, but 
early stage is probably around a little bit before diagnosis till a little bit after maybe a year or two after then mid maybe two to three years and then late stage is when you are um, really having less and less functioning um, but you're still quote unquote living um, so, and then the long duration of the disease contributes significantly to the public health impact of, of Alzheimer's disease. So the Alzheimer's Association has taken a public health approach to this disease. Um, this disease can easily bankrupt this country um, because the cost of care is so high and there's no financial assistance for it. So if there's no financial assistance for it, it means that caregivers are either having to quit their jobs to afford to be able to care for their loved one um, or they're paying out of pocket. Um, and the, again, there's no, since there's no financial aid, the, the costs just keep increasing. I have such wonderful news today. <laughs> I'm a barrel of joy. Um, okay, so we have to update the slide, but um, not, not much has changed. Um, still, st all these statistics are, are, are still true. And um, again, it, that's why part all these reasons why we're taking a public health approach to to Alzheimer's disease to to making it to making people aware um, that there is a national helpline that you can get support. That's why we're throwing all this money, not throwing, really invested in doing deep, deep, deep research for this disease. The Alzheimer's Association is the um, is the third largest funder of research behind the American and Chinese governments um, for, for Alzheimer's disease. And we fund research on a local, national, and international level. Um, so I really want to hear from you where you as community members um, see that there's a gap in service, gap in education, um, looking to f what what how can you get more involved or how can you find out more or, or what whatever questions you have um, really this is that's kind of our goal and then our we hope to build off of that from from your input so anyone online um, we'd love to hear or anyone in the audience um, what your where, where you see that there's a disconnect or where we can improve or any questions you have Anyone want to go first? Anyone here caring for someone with Alzheimer's disease directly? No, that's good. Oh, who? Your mother has dementia. Okay, um, and you're you're helping. You're part of the care team. Your father has dementia. Okay. Um, and how long have they been, how long have you guys been caregiving for them? Uh huh. Beginning of the calendar year? Yeah. Yeah. It's really hard. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing. And um it's again, it's a it's it's a devastating disease cuz it goes on for forever and it just like just takes away um Little by little, it takes away the person, and it takes away our livelihood um, and their livelihood. It's you know, just it's it's horrible. Um, I didn't print out the questions, but maybe I can get them on my phone. There were some questions that people had had. Um, yeah, please.
<laughs> For sure. Freedom. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a s great point. Um, so I'm a social worker, and I've been working with Alzheimer's and dementia for about 18, 19 years. So I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV. I'm just kidding. Um, so I, my personal, my personal opinion is that you should start with your general doctor. Ideally, it would be a geriatric, um, a geriatric practitioner of a geriatric internist, um, and start. You, we start there and say something's been off, and like I don't, I don't feel like myself. They do a mini mental, depending on that score, you get a baseline, um, and or if there's a concern, we're referred to a neurologist. We have to go to a neurologist to get a definitive diagnosis, and then to me that relationship really need, can end there. Unless you have a very unique situation like um, FTD. Um, we have a, a, one of the expert, leading experts in FTD at UCLA, Dr. Mendez, he's fantastic. And I lead an FTD support group and everyone, <laughs> everyone's like, well, Dr. Mendez says. So in, that, in very specific cases, I think it's important to have a relationship with the neurologist. But then I think you go back to your geriatric internist and form a relationship with that, with that doctor, right? Um, you want someone who understands healthy aging as well as understands this disease. And if we're seeing um, a lot of behavior issues, like with FTD or just in general with Alzheimer's, so Alzheimer's can ramp someone's personality up to 10 or down to zero. So if they were stubborn before, they, like, they can be really stubborn or they can become super easygoing. Usually, usually they become more stubborn, but sometimes they become less. Um, so I also like to have a geriatric psychiatrist as part of the team so that you can always have someone to check in with regards to medication. Um, UCLA has a, and, and now Cedars has built one, and um, um, St. John is, has a great, a great clinic where they're really working on a, and Kaiser, uh, not every Kaiser, but some of the Kaisers have this, they're really building a clinic where you have a neurologist, a social worker, geriatric psychiatrist and an internist and an RN. Um, and I know with UCLA, like, they have an RN that is, your, in essence, your case manager. So you can always turn to them as your, as your lifeline. Um, and I love this approach because then there's, you know, one file, there's, you can just, you can make a phone call and they can look it up and be like, oh yeah, I understand and, and, and advise you that way. Um, I also strongly believe in the importance of a support group. Um, so that I feel like you learn everything, everything you need to know in that support group. Um, because you've either been there, or you are going to be there, or you're going there, or, or whatever, you're there right now. Um, and, so, and, and then you get tips like for doctors, or placement, or in-home care, or, or anything like that. Did that kind of answer your question? Yeah, sure. Did you have any questions?
yeah, it's always a fine line. I, I, I when I, um, I talk about in support group all the time is it's, um, first of all, it's not what you say, but it's how you say it, right? So it's all in our tone, it's all in our body language, which is critical, and it's all in our rhetoric too. So saying things in vague generalities can help move the conversation along to get her to be where we want her to be, where we need her to be. Um, and then managing her moods for sure. And I, I use ice cream as a redirecting tool all the time or cookies or rugula or whatever it's gonna, whatever it takes. But we're, it's a constant game of what, what's the next trick that's gonna, that's gonna work. Um, and empowering our caregivers to also have, to have some of that confidence in Great, yeah, ice cream, ice cream always, ice cream works often. Um, um, well, sometimes, that, maybe that's not, that's not always bad, um, but, you know, it helps, it's just, again, it helps get them, it, it serves numerous tools. Um, maybe it helps get their medication down, maybe it helps manage their mood, get them to where we need them to go. Um, so we so we use it a lot, and it, and it d they do tend to become very part of the reason that they're become more stubborn, right? Is th it's an element of some bit of control, plus they're not understanding of what we need from them and their inability to understand things in a logical way. So I always talk about like you have to put on your spacesuit, and you have to, once you put it on, that's your protective tool so that nothing that they say can harm you in any way, anything offensive that, or mean that they say, you're like, that's Alzheimer's, that's, I'm just, I'm in my protective suit and I'm gonna enter Alzheimer's world and now things can make sense to me because if I try to understand them in my world, we're not having the same conversation. Like, I'm speaking English and she's speaking Chinese and it's not, we're not communicating. Um, so that's, I always like to, reimagine our world and having to meet them there. Once we meet them there, then we can then we can communicate and hopefully get things more things done. Does that make sense? A little bit. Yeah, it's hard. It's a journey. Yeah. Yeah, that is a really great question. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Um it's a great question and there isn't I would never I would, there's no one answer that works for everybody. Right? It's um every family has a different unique circumstance and so we have to find the best situation for that family. Um, there are some great books. Um, I believe Maria Shriver wrote a book a few years ago saying, uh, called like My Grandfather Has Alzheimer's. Um, there is also one that I believe Muhammad Ali's daughter wrote about Parkinson's, but a, kind of like a similar thing in explaining that there's a disease occurring, there's a disease happening, and we, we want to meet them where they're at. We, sometimes our answer for our loved ones is like, bring over the grandkids, let's have a party. And sometimes that's too much stimulation for our loved one. They're like, whoa, and they're gonna have a reaction to that, right? So we need to always have, we always need to have a plan B. Um, if we notice that the, that our loved one's behavior is ramping up, like, all right, let's time, time to scale it down. Now it's time for quiet time. Um, and I think just, uh, I believe in gentle honesty um, explaining to the kids, this is, we, there's, there is, our, our loved one is not well, they're not behaving in a normal way, we just have to be, meet them with patience and kindness and love, and if they, if we feel uncomfortable, then we have to, we just, we don't have to, we don't have to commit, we don't have to, like, 
sacrifice our time to spend with them, especially if, if they're little kids. But find activities that are mutually engaging for the two of them to do together, that are easy, that meet our loved one where they're at while maintaining their dignity and also drawing in the interest of our of our kids having and and, and, it, and that will change throughout the disease process so early stage will be a little different than middle stage and middle stage will be way different than late stage and late stage might just be sitting and holding their hand or giving them a hand rub of a hand massage or just being present in the room and it's not also there's no one clocking the amount of time that you're spending with them right like no one wants to be under the pressure of like, if I'm not here for 75 hours, then it doesn't count. Well, that, that doesn't work either. So I'd rather have a meaningful 15 minutes than a forced three hours. Um, and that might be a good tip for children. Thank you. Um, what about family members who might be in denial about changes they're observing in their family member? Yeah. I would say, I would say that's dangerous. Um, we, the Alzheimer's Association, really encourages getting an early diagnosis. No one in the history of ever has said, oh, "I can't wait to go to the doctor. I hope they tell me it's Alzheimer's disease." Right? Like, no one has ever said that. No one is ever going to say that. Um, but we want to know what's happening so we can put it in the right box so that we can appropriately manage it, right? We have to make decisions for our future based on, um, you know, what financial decisions are we going to make? What, what care decisions are we going to make? We want to have them be a part of that plan. And we don't want them driving. Um, people often think we don't want them driving because they come, become forgetful, and yes, that is true, but we don't want them driving because they don't understand the, um, the um, distance and their periphery. Um, so if they, yes, they might know their way to and from work, um, but they're not taking into account all the everything that's happening around them. If someone runs a light, if someone's crossing illegally, if someone whatever, they're not taking that information and they don't have the capacity to make a decision quick enough to not harm somebody. I have a lot of people who have told me, my husband is still working. I'm like, oh yeah, what does your husband do? I never, it doesn't even matter, but Oh, he's an architect. Oh, he's a lawyer. Oh, he's a therapist. Like all of those have a lot of consequences if you are working and you have questionable capacity of understanding, right? So again, no one wants to hear the answer is Alzheimer's, but we really want to manage it sooner rather than later because I'd rather not see your whole life savings be taken away because of decisions that you made with with a disease that you were or were not aware of that you were not, you weren't managing properly. So. Another question yeah. from online. Um, there was some concern given the, the reality of a hereditary tendency. Um, how concerned should younger people be um, maybe those who are considering starting a family um, or are already pregnant and considering it, should they be yeah. getting screening? Um, any comment That's about that? That's such a personal question. Like, I don't think I personally would have the courage to know in advance. Um, they are working, they are, we are working the research to find a more deterministic evaluation like from a blood test um, again you can be you can be a gene carrier and not get it so now you've lived your whole life waiting in anticipation and nothing happened hopefully um, I don't I don't I don't honestly I don't like to answer that question because it's such a personal choice and I, I was I had the um, remarkable opportunity uh, every year the Alzheimer's Association um, sponsors an international conference 
and a few years ago it was in Los Angeles, and so it's people, research from, researchers from all over the world, and they are, there is a study of people who do carry the hereditary line um, who are 99.9% .9 likely to have it, to get, to, get, to get Alzheimer's disease, and so the person they're caring for plus their, um, their relatives are in a study to get an international study together, and it was incredible to be in the room with them and even hear, like, I got tested. I didn't get tested. I'm a new mom. I don't know. I, you know, all those things were heard, and there's so much room. It's such a personal choice. So, I I, I personally couldn't comment on that. I, I just think you have to you have to just do what's best for you and your family. Definitely talking about it with your partner and making those choices together. Any other thoughts or questions? Any other places that you feel like, oh, I didn't know that there was an, I didn't know that there was an Alzheimer's Association. I didn't know that there was a national helpline I could call. I wish I had more resources, education in the area of, I don't know, like legal guidance or Medicaid or why don't we have a support group here? Oh, we do. We're gonna start a support group <laughs> um, for community members, so um, come join us. Although Carolyn and I would love to sit and just chat together, um, we'd love to have other people in the room. So it's gonna be five weeks? Uh, four for sure, possibly five. Four for sure, possibly five. You're gonna love it. It's gonna be so much fun. Once you're in, you can't, you can't have enough. Um, yeah, El, yeah. maybe you can speak a bit to the benefit of a uh, support, support group sure. for family members. Sure. So as I said a little bit earlier, support groups to me are the greatest thing that you can do for yourself as a, as a caregiver or someone wanting to know more about the disease. You just, you're in a room full of people who understand what you're doing, who understand what you're going through, who understand the difficult things that you have to say without judgment just like any other situation it's nice to it's nice to bond with people who are in your similar circumstances so um again i've been working with this disease for about 18 or 19 years support groups are my favorite thing to do i always say i don't have time for another support group and then someone says will you lead a support group for this i'm like oh, of course i will right like i'm completely addicted but it's just it's a great it's just a great place to get to, to know that you're not alone, to try to think outside the box of how we can come up with a solution for this particular issue that we're stuck in at home um, and want to and want to see what worked for the person to the right, the person to the left might be taking notes for what how they're going to use that and make it make it their own. So um, it's an hour and a half, once a week or once a month or however long the group goes for, um, and it's a true gift that you give to yourself. You can, you can be in a room and say the difficult things that you feel like your friends and other family members would judge you for, and say it openly and freely and not be judged. So that's my, that's my <laughs> soapbox on that one. Um, yep. Yes. The group um, will be, um, as I said, four sessions, Wednesdays at 10 o'clock in person here. And it'll be Yael and myself leading the group. And beyond those four weeks, is there a discussion of possibly continuing it, or are you still getting into the... Uh, yeah, I think we'll see. Yes. Yes. We absolutely are open to uh, meeting um, the community's needs. And should our group, um, and there isn't any reason why it won't, um, come together and desire to continue meeting, we'll, we'll make that happen. Uh, maybe not necessarily, it might change, uh, I'll be here. Um, Yael will, may need to be called away to other communities um, to get um, groups started. I have to get a fix somewhere else. But, <laughs> um, um, I lead but, plenty of groups. But uh, yes, for sure, um, through the Mental Health Center at Sinai Temple for members, um, we can continue to meet. Awesome. Any other questions, thoughts, anything about Alzheimer's? There's some, um, one of you asked me about medication. There's a, we're having some a very exciting time with advancements in medication. Um, unfortunately, 
it's not going to help your family, but um, there, for the first time in over a decade, we have seen medication that's actually slowing the progression of the disease um, by, you know, at least a minimum of six months. So, you know, when you look at that as, as a whole in the spectrum of the disease, six months isn't that much, but when it's your family member and it's another six months of good health, um, then we'll take it, right? So, um, and the, the association is really backing this research, but not only are we really backing the research, we've really doubled down on our efforts to make sure that um, the medication is covered through um, Medicare and Medicaid, and they have just approved it. Um, so that makes it affordable and equitable for everyone to get because if it's not affordable and it's just sitting on the shelf, then it's not helpful to anybody. Um, so there, we're very, very excited about this medication. We've had three new medications come out in the last year and we see more on the trajectory. So it's, it's exciting. And, and the other moving thing about this international convention is good news, bad news, but since COVID, right, we, we can make everything kind of go virtual. When, I, when it was here in Los Angeles, we had at least 7,000 people participating, researchers participating from all over the world, and the um, making it virtual made it to at least 10,000, and those are people who are actively researching. They're actively interested in finding a cure for this disease, so it's a global issue. Um, we 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 want to we want to find a we want to find a cure. Um, that's that's the whole goal of the association is to find the first survivor. So um, we're we're excited about what's what's happening. Yeah. The question for give me if you if you were discuss this before I arrived, um, but you're talking there's there's. Alzheimer's and then dementia, but what's the difference? Or when you're talking about Alzheimer, are you talking about all forms of dementia? So, so that's a great that question. We did talk about it, but it's a great question and it's worth repeating. So dementia is the umbrella term okay. and Alzheimer's is the most diagnosed type of dementia. So it's like, I don't remember the actual the, the statistic, but it's like 90% of the di of di dementia diagnosis is Alzheimer's. I'm not 100% sure on that, 90%, but it's high up there. Um, I used to have, I have a pie chart in, on my computer somewhere. Um, you can use the terms interchangeably, um, but so when you go to get a diagnosis, um, the neurologist will say, you have dementia, you have, you have Alzheimer's, and if you want further, more conclusive, um, testing done on what type of dementia you have. Like, do you have primary progressive aphasia? Do you have FTD? Do you have vascular dementia? Those are all done through process of, through, through different testing. So they start with an MRI, they're looking at blood work, um, they're gonna run a battery of neuropsych tests. Um, they might, they'll, alter, they'll do a PET scan hopefully, which is really like the definitive image of your brain of where it's impacting and how and what what's what's happening so some people prefer to say alzheimer's some people prefer to say dementia you can use those interchangeably but dementia is the is the umbrella term like cancer so for instance my mother's 95 so they're not going to be running all the time i mean they're not going to run the test to find it because it's to put her through that doesn't make yeah. a difference right no yeah, and, so, and, and they've just said dementia. So. Yeah, I, and the, for the most part, the treatment is relatively the same. Um, FTD has different treatment with regards to managing medication for behavior, but they're all progressive terminal illness. It, it, dementia is a progressive terminal illness. Um, and so there isn't a cure for, for dementia or Alzheimer's. The Alzheimer's Association does serve all dementias, um, but the name has stuck as <laughs> the Alzheimer's Association. Um, I think it is, I think we do say serving all dementias. But. Yeah? When you, when you say that people die from Alzheimer's or dementia, what is it that they 
what happens that they die from versus they live with this and something else is what Great question. So you can them. absolutely have comorbidity issues going on. You could have Alzheimer's and cancer. You can have Alzheimer's and um, a stroke. You can have all, you can die of pneumonia. You can have Alzheimer's and pneumonia, right? But basically, it's a it's a terminal illness, and we have fought really hard to have Alzheimer's written on the death, death certificate to one raise awareness and two raise research dollars, because ultimately your brain can't say like, oh, there's an infection. Now I need to fight that infection, or oh, I have a they have a cold. Like now let's get everything going so we can fight this cold. Your brain is not able to to tell you that because of the physical disease that's happening in your brain, right? The, the increase of gray matter, the increase of plaque and amyloids that's building on, your, on the neurotransmitters, right? Our, our brain, there's a, something happens here, and then there's a message, and it gets to here, and then you're like, oh, my brain just told me to pitter-patter across the room. Your brain can't tell you that anymore. So the, it's impacting the blood flow. It's impacting your breathing. It's impacting your swallowing. That's why it's a progressive terminal illness. So you can, again, you can die of pneumonia or whatever, a wound infection, um, but it's because, because of Alzheimer's. Does that make, that make sense? Great question. Great question. Any other thoughts or questions? I think, yeah. <laughs> what about the new molecule that uh, the Israel invented lately? There's a lot of stories about that. Is it a, a, some, is it a treatment or prevention? Um, I believe it's, I need to do more research on it. I'm, I just like read it in a, in a blurb. I believe it will, it's looking at treatment, but still in its in a more in a discovery phase so but it's definitely being talked about it's definitely being looked at but not a cure yet but like i said internationally this is a this is a it's a big it's big news it's exciting news there's a lot of exciting news coming um it's it's the world it's a global issue not related to current events <laughs> Uh, I have a grandma who is terrified that she has it, and yeah. she's kind of embarrassed to go to the doctor. How do, how do you um, combat that without with showing like compassion? Yeah, that is also a great question. So it turns out, first of all, Medicare covers as part of your annual wellness visit. Medicare also covers a memory screen. We did a, um, a survey a few years ago. And it turns out that both the patient and the doctor were aware of this, but both were waiting for the other one to ask. And, you know, so the, the, the doctor, it's uncomfortable, so no one wants to bring it up and no one wants to talk about it. So the doctor's like, well, they didn't say anything, and maybe they're not exhibiting anything. And the, doc, and the patient's like, well, they didn't say anything, so he didn't notice anything, so I'm fine. Whew. Right? That's not the case. Um, so we really want to encourage people to get an annual, have it be part of your annual screening. Um, so that you can have a baseline. So that in, in six months, you, you took the mini mental, you got 20 out of 20, great. Then a year later, you went in, you got 18 out of 20, all right, cool, well, now we know. Then a year later, you got, or six months later, like something just doesn't feel right. You got 16 out of 20, you're like, hmm, all right, what's going on? That's not your baseline. Um, are you over medicating with over-the-counter medication? Are you stressed? Are you sleeping? Do you have a thyroid issue? Do you have a brain tumor? Do you have like other, something that could be reversible? We really want to encur encourage the doctor having a baseline of where you're at. Um, like I said earlier, no one is ever going to the doctor to be like, oh, I hope they tell me it's Alzheimer's. No one's going to say that. Um, so, and you want to encourage her, you, you know, it's not every person, as we get older, we become forgetful. Um, how many people you know, you walked into a room just just today or this week, you walked into a room, you're like, wait, what am I, what am I getting in here? T 
two. There's two of us? Thank you. Thank you for being honest, right? You walk in and, and then I saw a meme that, that was like, I'm so proud of myself. I walked into a room and I remembered why I walked in there. Um, so we all become forgetful. But if you are becoming forgetful <clears throat> to the point where it's impacting your life, there might be an issue. If you are, it's, they say it's not what, that you don't remember what your, where you put your car keys, it's that you don't remember what your keys are for. Um, I often give this example of if I have an irregular day and I've decided to go do some food shopping on my way to work instead of after work, because for whatever reason, right? And I pick up milk and eggs or cheese or something that has to go in the fridge. I love that I'm admitting this on national, on, on, on the Wi-Fi, but I put my keys in the grocery bag in the fridge. Right? So that I remember where my, so that I remember to go to the fridge, because otherwise they'll stay in the work fridge forever because I never go in there. Um, I'm going to leave work. Where are my keys? Where are my keys? Where are my keys? Minor freak out, maybe some, maybe some words that aren't necessarily appropriate. And then I'm like, oh wait, hold on. I went shopping this morning. I put them in the fridge so I remember where my keys were. I can recall that, right? Someone with memory issues can't recall, can't do that recall. Um, so we want to maybe, we, want it, we definitely want to have her go to the doctor and, and, get, and check in, but we all, we also reassuring them that we all become forgetful. But being able to retrace your steps, be, being able to have logical, reasonable thinking, being able to show up for our appointments, being able to understand a calendar, um, being able to tell time, like all of these things are important to, to our daily life. Um, if something is not working, then we, and we, we definitely want to get it checked because maybe it is something reversible and that we've been stressing over nothing. But when we're not sleeping, like we're not at our best, right? Eight hours of sleep is the numerical drug. How many people here get eight hours of sleep, uninterrupted sleep a night? No one, right? <laughs> Even if you have to get up to go to the bathroom, if you, can you fall back asleep? Often no. When you're young, yes. <laughs> when, as you get older, it gets harder, right? So eight hours of uninterrupted REM sleep is the, our goal. I would say people just probably get an average of six to seven if we're lucky. Um, but as that adds up, are you functioning at your best when you, are, when you only got three hours of sleep? No. Are you making good decisions? No. So there might be something else going on, which is why, again, we want to check in, check in with the doctor. But reassuring her that um, forgetfulness is a part of normal aging, but if other things, and you can look up on our website, we have our 10 signs. If she's got three or four of those signs, then we definitely want to go check in with the doctor. Um, just if I might add, yeah, um, just a smidge Please. about that. Um, I think that having these conversations are um, critical um, within the family um, and to say, um, engage your grandmother with um, help her articulate what her fears are. Um, and then to validate those fears and to reassure her then that um, whatever the doctor says or doesn't say, that the family will be there with her um, to assist. Um, her to carry on whatever journeys ahead. Um, I think it's really, really important to um, to engage as a family or with significant others, um, sometimes close friends, support group, um, but in your case um, with your grandmother that um, really understanding that it is frightening and that it can be, as, as you said, nobody wants, nobody wants to go to the doctor and express a concern. Um, but the reassurance that she isn't alone, she won't be alone, and that whatever the journey holds, you'll be able to assist and support through that journey. And we have a great talk on um, dementia conversations, mm. which is kind of like a, right. we notice as a family that there's something going on, so how do we sit down and have that important conversation? Um, no one, nobody wants to be told you can't drive, we're taking away your keys. No one wants to be told we're gonna make a decision about 
where and how you're going to live the rest of your life. Um, but we want to keep them safe, and we want to. We might have to make some decisions on their on their behalf. Hopefully, with some of their participation. Yeah. Does the association you 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 s said earlier, you know, the, the best thing is to start with your primary care physician and get referred to a neurologist. Does the association have a uh, a referral list of neurologists? Because it's hard to find a neurologist and hard to get in. I mean, fortunately, we have one, but I mean, it in is general, so hard. since COVID, it's been so hard even to before, get in. Before, but yeah, but is there is there like a referral list that the association has or? just for other people yeah so the way the the yes um one we have what's called a community resource finder that works um with in a with in partnership with aarp so if you're doing long distance caregiving um you can look look things up by zip code online um second if you call the helpline if you happen to call the helpline um it's 24 seven and up to 200 languages, they can also give referrals. They, they also use the community resource finder. And then what happens is you'll get a follow up from, um, from a local office, so someone like me, and it'll say, um, Jane called the Alzheimer's Association, the, the helpline, she's looking for a neurologist. And then by region, we, um, we can give you like a more directed list um, or suggestions. Um, you know, the, the gift of being in Los Angeles is we have, we work closely with UCLA, we work closely with USC, we work closely, well, UCI, um, and, uh, and other research institutions that have fantastic clinics, um, you know, right, right, Cedars, sorry, Cedars has a great program. Um, we have a lot of options. I said before, St. John's has a great, um, a great clinic as well, um, so, we're, we're very lucky to have a lot of resources, especially on the west side, but um, our chapter specifically covers from Bakersfield to Coachella Valley, so you would get, I, I manage the west side of town, um, you would get, you would speak to someone locally who could advise. Awesome, all right. Any other questions, thoughts? Anything where you really feel like I would love to see the association really step up and do? No, okay, all right. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for participating and. Um, um, thank you, Yael, so much for this very informative, um, sensitive, compassionate presentation. Um, for those of you online, thank you for for um, joining us this morning. And those of you here, um, there are um, bagels. Um, so <laughs> please. <laughs> and um, rugelach. <laughs> Don't forget <laughs> the rugelach. Um, so please um, have a snack before you leave. Um, we will, Yael and I will be here um, for the next four Wednesday mornings for a support group, as we said, um, 10 to 11.30 for Sinai Temple members uh, and employees. Um, and um, I know some of you have already indicated an interest in joining us, and um, we're excited to get started in a more intimate setting. Um, if you have not yet res responded RSVP'd, there is still time to do so, and um, you can uh, call me. Um, my direct line is uh, 310. Uh, 481-3209 um, or C. Hoffman at SinaiTemple.org and um, just let me know of your interest and um, we'll, we'll give you all the information you need to join us uh, next week. Okay, um, and also I am here full time um, for those of you who do have additional questions who may not be able to join for the support group. <laughs> there is the helpline. Um, through the Alzheimer's Association, um, and I'm here to answer any questions in addition, <coughs> excuse me, to, um, for medical resources. Um, there are resources that I have um, would be uh, regarding uh, in-home supportive services, um, other kinds of, um, any other kinds of assistance that you might need. So, um, 
so I'm here for you. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Yael, um, and I uh, hope everyone has a beautiful day. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Are we off? <laughs> Even the crew got involved. Love that.